New Year, New Craig. Y'all have been asking for a new Craig of the Creek video for a bit, and I know I've been slacking, but rest be assured, I'm always ready to talk about how fire this show continues to be. Seriously, season three has been some heat, whether if it's your average episode or an advancement in the overarching narrative. So while you're probably here for me to dig into the deeper story episodes, I want to put a spotlight on not just the rise and fall of the green poncho and the doubling special winter break, but all five episodes from December and January. Nearly every episode this season has been standing on their own as memorable classics, something I haven't felt about too many episodic cartoons in a long time. That's not to say other shows have bad episodes, but Craig of the Creek sticks with you because they are perfecting an aspect of the show that makes it stand out to people, centering episodes off of universal childhood experiences. It's much easier to connect with the bad haircut episode, the sleepover and meeting your friend's parents episode, or the floor is lava episode. Of course, this doesn't mean other cartoons are inherently flawed or bad or lesser than. I'm just not able to connect with them the same way I'm able to connect with Craig of the Creek. I just hope more of the newer titles go for this. This show is pivoting to more and more relatable situations that also managed to surprise me off the merit of, wow, why haven't more cartoons tackled episodes like this? Big City Greens is another cartoon that's slaying the game just as much as Craig for similar reasons. And if what they're doing wasn't working, these two shows wouldn't be the most popular studio originals on their respective networks. At the moment, of course. That being said, Cartoon Network, what's good? I get you kind of waved the white flag for fixing your TV channel at the moment, but this show right here? Why are we still doing random episode drops on the app? Why aren't you giving more gas to the special length episodes by putting them in primetime? Like, you realize this is your current big show, right? Like, this is your top dog replacing Steven Universe, which makes sense considering the creators were the head writers on Steven, and before that, Adventure Time was the big show, and Rebecca Sugar left Adventure Time to create Steven, you get the idea. Why treat this show so basic? It deserves so much more, and I'm confident viewership would actually increase for the first time in forever. It deserves so much more. More reruns, more promotion, more special events built around big episodes. Please, step it up. Stop leaving your network in a broken state. And please, don't repeat history. Craig, much like Big City Greens, is a show that's proven to be watched by everyone right now. And when I say everyone, I really just mean people of all ages. Not only is it a smash hit with kids, whereas story cartoons generally attract more teenagers and adults than kids, but that aforementioned older demographic of teens and adults do enjoy the show. Just because not everyone who is watching story cartoons is into Craig doesn't mean that an older audience doesn't exist. I know plenty of people that I went to high school with that casually watch Craig, and these are the kind of people that would never watch Steven, Star, you know, any big cartoon that fans try to sell to older people off the merits that they can enjoy it. Cartoon Network, just check social media. I'm sure you'll find an array of accounts that talk about this show. Hardcore animation fans and very casual television viewers. Also, can we talk about how fire the title cards are in season three? They switch up the style every season, but we've gone from items and backgrounds related to the episode at hand to full on illustrations of the characters, beautifully painted for the audience at home to feast their eyes on. And it's just that little bit of spice that adds so much more to the atmosphere of the series. Before we talk about the episodes at hand, I just want to remind y'all to like and subscribe. Obviously, if you're new here, you probably want to figure out if you like the content first, but in this day and age of YouTube, I know a lot of you regular viewers just come from the recommended, so it's easy to forget, but subscribing does help the channel in a big way. By the way, thanks for a million! It means a lot, and special videos are on the way. And finally, we have a quick word from our sponsor. I've been rewatching a lot of childhood cartoons lately, and you know what I realized? The Kids Next Door is stacked with security measures and protocols. Yet those dummies don't have ExpressVPN, the sponsor of today's video. Privacy and the internet don't always see eye to eye, and through ExpressVPN, your internet connection is rerouted through a secure, encrypted server, so you can surf the web anonymously without anyone looking over your shoulder. Incognito mode isn't hiding you from anyone other than your family. Every site you visit is still tracked by your internet providers, and said providers can even sell that data to ad companies. ExpressVPN is super easy. All it takes is a literal press of a button and it can be accessed on your computer, tablet, or smartphone. 
Not to mention, it's a new year. So if you're looking for something new to watch in 2021, ExpressVPN gives you way more shows and movies on streaming, as you can access catalogs from all around the world. If I change my VPN location to the UK, I can go on Netflix and watch cartoons that are scattered on other services in the US, like Rick and Morty, Close Enough, and Final Space. Even some YouTube videos are region locked, but with a press of a button, they aren't anymore. ExpressVPN is the fastest VPN on the market, with glowing reviews, 24-7 customer service, and easy access. You truly can access it anywhere, and you can get three months free with a 12-month plan only by clicking the link in the description, expressvpn.com slash roundtable. Again, this free three months is in addition to the 12-month plan at expressvpn.com slash roundtable. Take back your internet privacy today. All right, starting with the episodic episodes of The Batch, we have I Don't Need a Hat. An episode like this should have been made ages ago, but as far as I'm aware, Craig of the Creek is one of the first to do it, and it also takes advantage of the show's shift to fall and winter, like many of these episodes. Not just making jokes about the cold, everyone does that, but centering an entire episode around the premise of being ill-prepared for the winter. In a very simple premise, Craig feels as if his mom is overdressing him for the creek, forcing upon him all the winter gear staples. Hat, gloves, coat? I'm surprised a scarf wasn't thrown into the mix. Naturally, Craig thinks his mom is being a little bossy and overprotective, and his winter clothing gets in the way of his creek activities. So he gradually removes more and more until he's a Craigsicle. An element of Craig I've praised before is the show taking advantage of its animated medium to accurately portray a children's imagination in ways we utilized our own imagination as a child. I know some people may just see an easy opportunity for the show to make references, but I don't know, when I played pretend as a kid, I was envisioning off what I knew, which was TV, movies, and video games. So they feel warranted in Craig. Granted, this episode doesn't really make a reference, but instead provides neat little visuals for Craig's body heat. And God, let me tell you, I relate to this episode. I was the kid who hated wearing gloves and hated wearing hats. Like, sorry, I prefer technology to recognize my fingers. And no one likes hat hair. Well, I mean, I'm sure some people do, but that's besides the point. Yet, for someone who didn't really like wearing gloves and didn't really like wearing hats, I sure got cold easily to the point where I could barely move my frozen fingers. And I endured this the most in, you guessed it, public school waiting for the bus. So I know stubborn 12-year-old me would have loved this episode. And also as someone who's had his fair share of Sonic phases, I adore Craig's Slight the Ferret Lock screen, because if I had a smartphone in middle school, I have no doubts I would have had a similar lock screen, and I love how it changes to a different picture of Slide in Snow Day. I also love how weird Roger is. Like, the climax of this episode comes down between Craig and a mud man getting Craig's hat, and Roger's solution is giving Craig the hat so Roger can become one with Creaky. Roger is like Onion but with the ability to speak, and they're getting as much mileage as possible out of that concept. And the moral of this episode is one so sweet and one of the most important of the series thus far. When I'm sharing advice, it's not because I love telling you what to do. It's because I'm trying to share something I experienced, so hopefully you don't have to. This is beautiful. I'm going to reiterate what I wrote on Twitter a few days ago. Parents are a sensitive topic for a lot of people. And I think for the longest time when growing up, a lot of media kids consumed portrayed both parents as service level negative stereotypes. I'm glad kids media of today portrays flawed, but well-intended parents. And I like that this episode still provides a consequence for Craig, as he gets sick at the end. Although, this is a weird episode to watch as the entire world is in a Panasonic or whatever. Next up is the episode Snow Day. So even though having a snow day in cartoons is nothing new, this episode, much like the previous, feels like something that should have been done ages ago. Craig wants a snow day, but only receives a two hour delay. So with time to spare, he decides he'll manifest a snow day into existence. Craig, Jessica, and Bernard watching TV for school closings. God, this felt vindicating to watch. Have they called our school district yet? Nah, no, they're still in the Fs. I waited for so long to see a cartoon nail it on the head like this. A true universal experience. Unless you're homeschooled, I guess. I don't, I don't really know. Someone out there has to be homeschooled. What was that like? 
please let us know in the comments below. Now, I've actually never had a two hour delay growing up. Even on days where snow did melt a few hours in, we would just have a snow day entirely or no snow day at all. But I did have late starts later on in high school. Where the bus would pick us up at like 11 or 12, we would go to school for three classes and then head home. Craig goes to Tabitha and Courtney, the witches of the creek, in hopes of having his wish granted, and ends up being sent off on a quest in order for them to perform a ritual. When in reality, they're just sending the kids off to run some errands. Coffee, food, phone charger, yeah, I remember those days. The kids botch it of course, but everything works out in the end regardless. The witches even make a joke about how this happens a lot, and honestly, I'm glad it does. There was also a moment in this episode with Bernard and Craig that I really liked, where we explore Craig's optimism and determination for a snow day, whereas Bernard's teenage years has hardened him into a pessimistic shell of a boy who's lost all faith in snow days. Whether it was the very real crisis of climate change or Herkelton's robust supply of salt trucks, the snow would always melt. Which of course is paid off in the resolution, as Bernard has a little bit of childlike wonder instilled back into him. <laughs> I'm so happy! Also, this is random and I never acknowledged it in the video, but I thought of it while watching this episode. The Williams have a really nice house. Yeah, it ain't the Finn and Jake tree house or the future beach house, but I don't know, I'd live in it. How they explore the magic of a snow day here honestly got me a bit choked up. That's not something I'm really gonna experience ever again. Sure, you still get snow days in college, but by that point, it's college, you've already basically made your schedule. But waiting for your school listing to pop up on the TV, making plans with your friends, having a blast playing in the snow, they never hit as much as they do when you're a kid. Also, this is a bit unrelated, but I kind of want to see them go to school. Don't go fool Edda and Eddie season 5 with it, and I know this show is about the creek, so we'd likely never see it, but come on, at least a field trip episode. Then we have the 100th episode extravaganza, alternate creek -averse. and it does one of my favorite animated series tropes, redoing the first episode with a new twist on it. Not to be confused with the pilot, although the opening scene of this episode does mirror the pilots. Craig, Kelsey, and JP imagine what life would be like at the creek if they weren't best friends, leading to us viewing an altered beginning of the series. Craig is a junior forest scout, no longer Craig of the Creek, with a fresh fate to boot. JP's a paintballer, and Kelsey is a ninja kid, all three struggling to fit into their respective roles in this universe. This episode of course does a few fun little changes with this being an alternate universe and all. Craig has a close, friendly relationship with Bernard, who probably needs to shave. Kelsey has an accent when monologuing, and instead of Mortimer the bird, Kelsey has a rat on her head, the scratchless one is shredded for no reason, and instead of cheese sticks, Wildernessa's animal companion is none other than Cat Steven from Steven Universe, but you know, a big boy. The credits are sung with feminine vocals? Who sung this cover? It's really good. And instead of the horn that signals that it's dinner time, we have musician and series composer Jeff Rosenstock. And more importantly, and even if this isn't the case, the first thing I thought of when I saw him was, is that Garnet's torso design in his sunglasses? Instead of wanting to just complete the map for his own sake, gaining notoriety, the motivation for marking the trampoline has to do with Craig, Kelsey, and JP wanting to become legends after feeling like outsiders in their social circles. But the resolution follows the first episode's line of reasoning all the same, and it works. Not to mention this episode is overall extremely sweet. No matter what universe they're in, Craig, Kelsey, and JP are destined to be best friends. They can't imagine a world where they aren't friends. Alright, and now to check in with the story, starting with the rise and fall of the Green Poncho. Episodes like these feel like Matt and Ben are fully leaning into things that Steven Universe fans wanted from the original series. You know, since they're head writers and all. Then again, it could just be more of them wanting to do things they've always wanted to do with the series, but for whatever reason, they weren't able to. You'll immediately understand what I'm talking about in a bit, but with Steven Universe, the voice actors for a lot of characters, especially Gems, did not seem like they were cheap. Whereas I feel like the voice talents of Craig the Creek are more common voice actors you see pop up everywhere, or they're just voiced by the crew themselves. I don't know much about budgeting or rates, but I imagine as a result, recurring characters and speaking roles are probably a lot more affordable, but that's going off a literal baseless assumption. That being said, Craig and Omar gather around the Council of the Creek in order to discuss the impending invasion of King Xavier and his other side of the creek. I love this. 
too often in stray cartoons is there an impending threat, and a lead character just kind of sits around and twiddles their thumbs until something happens. So it's a breath of fresh air for Craig to actually take the time out to gather his friends and comrades and let them know what's been going on. Unfortunately, most of the console does not take the threat of Xavier seriously, which of course they should. But let me just say, this is how you effectively build tension without lifting a finger. We as an audience have already witnessed plenty of encounters with Xavier. We know how terrifying and influential he can be. But of course to the rest of the creek, his reign is gonna sound like a bunch of malarkey. And if their own royalty, Eliza, is downplaying it, why would they take any of this seriously? And this actually leads to my favorite visual gag of the episode. Whenever Eliza interrupts Omar's story, not only is it presented like a YouTube video player, but the runtime clocks in at 11 minutes. It's the little things that get me. All these flashback episodes with Omar, Maya, and Xavier are important in different ways. I'd argue this is one of the most important thus far, as it presents the cracks in the King and Maya's relationship, and it plants the seeds for Maya's eventual redemption. Maya decided to join Xavier for respect and recognition, but his narcissistic tendencies prevent her from ever fully having a spotlight. Something's gotta give eventually, especially when there's a side of the creek that would likely welcome her with open arms. We also see how unnecessarily cruel the king can be, exacting revenge on peers now that he's king, having his forces destroy their toys. And of course, we get some KND type action. We love to see it. We also learn the complicated pool that King Xavier has around the creek. When you're a kid, he's the closest you can get to cool status. He has everything you would want. New top of the line toys, the best brand name snacks, and plenty of quote unquote friends. But Xavier is aware that youth is a double-edged sword, and once you're out of middle school, it's no longer socially acceptable to hang out at the creek. This is how the original Green Poncho fell. Xavier realized that she was none other than Michelle Green, who was in his sister Cheyenne's class, which makes her a freshman in high school, ineligible for the creek. I hope this will be explored further in present day, especially with the elders of the creek. Randy already has a strong resemblance to Elder Barry, so I'm assuming they're related, and they're clearly building him up to have a big role. I already know he's gonna have a dramatic present day debut. So Randy and Barry's standing of what's cool and what's not could collide. And of course, this is the kind of conversation that Craig the Creek would spread out through his overarching story. What's cool and what's childish? What's socially acceptable at a certain age? Why is there such a rush to grow up? And by this tale's end, we also see Omar take up the mantle as a green poncho. I don't think he frowns upon Michelle for walking away, but rather he understands that if she has to retire, someone new and younger has to fill in her shoes. But of course, Omar, Xavier, and Maya have gone through some sort of growth spurt since their flashback. We don't know how much time has passed since these flashbacks. Are they embarking into freshman year themselves? Season 3 alone has already explored fall and winter, so spring must be coming up, and I wouldn't be surprised if we saw summer again sooner or later. So if these characters are at the tail end of middle school, will Omar be expected to retire soon? Will there be a new King of the Creek? I hope they bring some clarification to this. And although most of the console of the creek has left Craig hanging, the Sewer Queen, Cannonball, and Jason return to show their support. I don't know if this means that the Sewer Kids, the Ten Speeds, and the Junior Forest Scouts are all on board for protecting the creek, but it makes sense that they are. The Sewer Kids would be great for keeping watch of any approaching forces while camouflaged by the sewer. The Ten Speeds would be good for both muscle and evacuation. Their bikes can allow them to play both offense and defense and the Junior Forest Scouts are super resourceful and know how to think quicker in their feet. So I imagine there's quite a few scenarios where they could be the MVP. In general, I think I want to talk about how every group in the Creek contributes something to defend themselves against this impending invasion. But last but not least, we have Winter Break. Guys, I love this special. Because it is a double length episode, I want to avoid doing an entire play-by-play -play of the story and instead fill y'all in just enough so I can focus on explaining why this episode works so well. To give you the TLDR for context, Craig returns to the creek after a two-week winter break and finds that Kelsey and JP have resentments towards him for going ghost the entire break after getting a new Scratch the Ferret game for Christmas. Their beef clashes with Omar holding off an invasion attempt from Xavier and his royal guard. 
hard. Via a snowball fight, Craig, Kelsey, and JP argue their way through the snowball fight, which escalates as the champions of the creek pull up. JP being caught in the middle as he understands where both sides are coming from. Eventually, Omar gets hurt, which leads the gang to reconcile as Craig and Kelsey own up to both of their ends of miscommunication and pull their heads together, pulling off a plan that forces Xavier to retreat. But unfortunately, Xavier's attempted coup was nothing more than a mere distraction, as Maya was scouting out the creek the entire time realizing Kit and her snack supply is the key to their conquest. Now, this special did so much right, especially with the internal character conflicts. Speaking of which, the internet oddly had beef with the Sonic references, namely Slide Adventure 2 Battle, and I just gotta ask, why? I can understand the argument that it's lazy. If cartoons weren't doing blatant references, I don't know, for the last 20 years? 30 years? 40? You get it, for a long ass time. Billy and Mandy has a parody of tournament arts, straight up titled Chicken Ball Z. Yet Slide Adventure 2 Battle is used as a catalyst for Craig blowing off Kelsey and JP. Not to mention, I think they're trying to make a particular point with Slide the Ferret being a blatant Sonic reference. Because yeah, they could just make a completely original video game character. Sure, why not? Craig can just be a simple fanboy in a simple fandom. But we all know, more than any online community, the Sonic fandom has it bad! Which can be discouraging not just for the people who grew up with Sonic, but for the people who are into Sonic today. People who watch cartoons today go on the internet. They play video games, they have interests outside of these cartoons, and engage with said interests online. So for anyone in the target demographic who's actually a Sonic fan, I think seeing Craig's enthusiasm for a blatant parody of the series actually means a lot. I think for a show to say, hey, it's cool to be a Sonic fan, actually goes a long way. It's not just, haha, funny reference anyone can understand. It's clearly coming from Sonic fans who have a point to make. It's not just a reference, it serves an actual purpose in the story. One that's actually important for not just kids, but anyone to learn. It's okay if you think texting back isn't a big deal, but there's a difference between not responding right away and ghosting your friends for days to weeks on end. And as someone with ADHD, I'm guilty as hell for this. This episode was calling me out hardcore, which is how I know it was some real shit. And it's important to teach kids a lesson like this so they don't grow up to have the habits people like me do. Yeah, sorry I haven't texted back in three months. I got distracted with video games and depression. <laughs> also, Kelsey being stranded with her great uncle at a retirement home for break is a mood. I remember being much younger and spending the weekend without any peers my age and having zero technology to rely on for entertainment. The action in this special was really solid. This is exactly why the k and comparisons persist. Both shows not only having similar role building and lore with their kid society, but despite Craig being way more grounded, the action has nearly escalated into similar extreme levels of cartoon absurdity. Green Poncho's neck arrows firing off multiple snowballs, the champions of the creek pulling of Ultron, the fact that they still haven't explained how the blur is basically Quicksilver, I love it. Don't even get me started on the reprise of We Don't Want No Trouble at the Creek from Crisis at Elder Rock. Let's fucking go! When I heard this, I started losing my mind. I don't know how the show does it to me, but it does it, and it does it good. Also, notice that Xavier remarks that he took down the green poncho all by himself, a line that I think is worth remembering. He won't recognize the hard work anyone but himself puts in. That won't pan out well in the long run, especially for the champions of the creek, as they have more of an established identity than the run-of-the-mill servant. And Xavier doesn't want to lose them, but if he keeps treating everyone like garbage and beneath them and not like an equal, it's going to bite him painfully in the ass. Xavier also mentions his siblings, one of which I believe has never been name dropped before, which serves to give us insight into his character and why he's so obsessed with being the best. It sounds like he loves being the king and hot shit at the creek because he feels under appreciated or constantly compared to his siblings at home. He may be spoiled and gets everything he wants, but he may not feel good enough in the eyes of his parents. But at the creek, he can be somebody, just like Maya. It would make sense as to why he hates feeling excluded. His home life, much like a lot of kids and teenagers, has a serious negative impact on his behavior. Or maybe I'm just projecting from my own days as an angsty, out-of-pocket kid. Nah. 
It sounds like Xavier is tired of being constantly compared to Cheyenne and the yet to be introduced Kevin. And pray for Kit, y'all. I don't want to see her get kidnapped. But I think what Xavier will try to do is partner with Kit. Not invade and take over by force, but take over by wooing the masses, just like he does on his side of the creek. Xavier was introduced as the kid who has all the brand name candy. The best snacks that they can't find on their side of the creek. So how much would things change if he provided it to them? And what would that mean for Craig and the others? Especially after Craig has painted Xavier as a villain. Ooh, I'm so excited! But as always, these are just my thoughts, and I want to hear yours. What do you think? Did you enjoy these new episodes? Which one did you enjoy most? Guys, again, I am amped to see where this all goes. And don't forget, you can always pop us a follow on social media over at Roundtable Vids and my own personal social media at Alshrek Vox. Again, if you enjoyed this video, please throw a like and subscribe. Shout out to our amazing patrons. And we'll talk to you next time. See ya!